Well, I'm very pleased to be here too. Um, I've, I've always liked the mercantile. It's one of these very individual, eccentric libraries that's been in New York for well, this since, since 1820, I guess, and it's it's uh, just wonderful, and I'm glad it's it's um, evolved into the, into something more contemporary feeling while not losing its old charm. Um, so thanks for to the Center of Fiction for inviting me and to the Bridge series, which I think is great. And I too, like Anna, I'm pleased to, to be here with Anna. I've known her for some years, and I'm glad to hear she's happy translating. <laughs> it's, it's not always a kind fate. So I wanted to read three sections, uh, short sections from Anna Bovary. I assume most of you know know the plot, which gets so, so sad, so devastating toward the end that I'm going to read toward the beginning. Um, and it also has to do always with, with Emma's disillusionment and um, of her romantic ideals. So I think I'll start with, you know, sort of before she's disillusioned, then when she's beginning to be disillusioned, and then when she's progressing in her disillusionment. <laughs> So this, this passage is taken from when Charles is courting Emma, and she will think it's exciting to marry a young doctor, but she'll soon find out that that's not so exciting. What's, and I'm, I'm going to point out interesting things that Flaubert's doing in these passages. Um, one thing to notice is her surface propriety mixed with her sensuality. Another thing is um, is what he does with shifting points of view, which is really amazing. He'll, he does this sort of seamlessly in, throughout the book, going from the, from the sort of third person objective to a little closer to the uh, mind of the, of the character, and then right into the mind of the character. He arrived one day about three o'clock. This is Charles, her future husband. Everyone was, everyone was in the fields. He entered the kitchen, but at first did not notice Emma. The shutters were closed. Through the slits in the wood, the sun cast over the flagstones, long, narrow stripes that broke at the angles of the furniture and trembled on the ceiling. On the table, flies were walking up the used glasses and buzzing as they drowned at the bottom in the dregs of cider. The daylight that came down the chimney, turning the soot on the fire back to velvet, touched with blue the cold cinders. Between the window and the hearth, Emma was sewing. She wore no fichu. On her bare shoulders, one could see little drops of sweat. As was the fashion in the country, she offered him something to drink. He refused, she insisted, and finally invited him, laughing, to have a glass of liqueur with her. So she went to get a bottle of Curaçao from the cupboard, took down two small glasses, filled one to the rim, poured almost nothing in the other, and after having touched it to his, raised it to her mouth. As it was almost empty, she leaned back to drink, and with her head tipped, her lips thrust out, her neck tensed, she laughed at feeling nothing, while the tip of her tongue passing between her delicate teeth licked with little stabs at the bottom of the glass. She sat down and took up her work again, a white cotton stocking to which she was making repairs. She sewed with her forehead lowered. She did not speak, nor did Charles. A draft of air passing under the door pushed a little dust over the stone floor. He watched it drift and heard only the pulse beating inside his head and the cry of a hen in the distance laying an egg in the yard. Emma from time to time would cool her cheeks by pressing them against the palms of her hands, which she would then chill on the iron knobs of the great fire dogs. 
She complained of having suffered since the beginning of the season from busy spells. She asked if sea bathing would be useful. She began to talk about the convent. Charles about his school. Words came to them. They went up to her room. She showed him her old music notebooks, the small books she had been given as prizes, and the wreaths made of oak leaves left in the bottom of a cupboard. She talked to him, too, about her mother, about the cemetery, and even showed him in the garden the bed from which she gathered flowers on the first Friday of each month to put on her grave. But their gardener knew nothing. Their servants were impossible. She would have liked so much to live in town, if only during the winter at least, though the long, fine days made the country perhaps even more tiresome in summer. And depending on what she was saying, her voice was clear, high-pitched, or suddenly languorous, trailing off in modulations that sank almost to a murmur when she was talking to herself, sometimes joyful, her eyes wide and innocent, and sometimes half-closing her lids, her gaze drowned in boredom, her thoughts wandering. That evening, as he was returning home, Charles took up again, one by one, the words she had used trying to recall them to complete their meaning in order to recreate for himself the portion of her life that she had lived during the time when he did not, know, know, did not yet know her. But he could never see her in his mind differently from the way he had seen her the first time or the way he had just left her. Then he wondered what would become of her, whether she would marry and whom. Alas, Père Rouault was very rich and she so lovely but Emma's face kept her turning to linger before his eyes, and something monotonous like the drone of a top kept buzzing in his ears. But what if he were to get married? What if he were to get married? That night, he could not sleep. His throat was tight. He was thirsty. He got up to drink from his water jug, and he opened the window. The sky was covered with stars. A warm wind was passing. In the distance, dogs were barking. He turned his face toward Les Berteaux. Thinking that after all, he had nothing to lose, Charles resolved to put the question when the opportunity arose. But each time it did arise, his fear of not finding the proper words sealed his lips. Another little thing about that passage is the flies walking up the, up the glass. Nabokov was very contemptuous of translators who had the flies crawling up the, the glass. He said, the flies do not crawl, they walk. And I took that very seriously. Um, the next section is from the early domestic life of uh, Charles and Emma and the, her, the first hint of disillusionment that she feels. Um, one interesting thing in the passage is, is a comparison of, of, of Charles' happiness, or his, his sense of his happiness, to the taste of truffles, which is a sort of typical thing that Flaubert would do to break any kind of romantic spell that he might be creating. Being an anti-romantic kind of guy. Another interesting thing is again the points of view and the transition at the end, the seamless transition from Charles's point of view to Emma's. She occupied herself during the first days with planning changes in her house. She took the globes off the candlesticks, had new wallpaper hung, the stairwell painted, and seats made for the garden around the sundial. She even asked how she could acquire a pool with a fountain and fish. And her husband, knowing that she liked to go for drives, found a second-hand gig which looked, which, sorry, what, which once it had new lamps and mud guards of padded leather, looked almost like a Tilbury. So he was happy without a care in the world, a meal alone with her, a walk in the evening on the road, the gesture of her hand touching the bands of her hair, the sight of her straw hat hanging from the hasp of a window, and many other things that Charles had never suspected would be a source of pleasure 
now form the continuous flow of his happiness. In the morning, I'm sorry, in bed in the morning and side by side on the pillow, he would watch the sunlight passing through the down on her blonde cheeks, half covered by the scalloped tabs of her nightcap. Seen from so close, her eyes appeared larger to him, especially when she opened her eyelids several times in succession as she awoke. Black when in shadow and dark blue in broad daylight, they seemed to hold layer upon layer of colors, denser deep down and lighter and lighter toward the enameled surface. His own eyes would lose themselves in those depths and he would see himself in miniature down to his shoulders with the silk scarf he wore around his head and the top of his half-open nightshirt. He would get up, she would go to the window to watch him leave, and she would remain there with her elbows on the sill between two pots of geraniums, her dressing gown loose around her. Charles in the street would be buckling his spurs, his foot up on the guard stone, and she would go on talking to him from above, tearing off with her teeth and blowing down to him some bit of flower or leaf, which would flutter float, make half circles in the air like a bird, and catch before falling in the ill-combed mane of the old white mare, motionless at the door. Charles on horseback would send her a kiss. She would answer with a wave. She would close the window. He would leave. And then on the road stretching out before him in an endless ribbon of dust, along sunken lanes over which the trees bent like an arbor, in paths where the wheat rose as high as his knees, with the sun on his shoulders and the morning air in his nostrils, his heart full of the joys of the night, his spirit at peace, his flesh content. He would ride along, ruminating on his happiness, like a man continuing to chew after dinner the taste of the truffles he is digesting. <laughs> Up to now, what had been what had there been in his life that was good? Was it his time in school where he remained shut in between those high walls, alone among schoolmates wealthier or better than he at their studies, who laughed at his accent, who made fun of his clothes, and whose mothers came to the visiting room with pastries in their muffs? Was it later when he was studying medicine, his purse never fat enough to pay for a contradance with some little working girl who might have become his mistress. After that, he had lived for 14 months with the widow whose feet in bed were as cold as blocks of ice. But now he possessed for always this pretty woman whom he so loved. The universe for him did not extend beyond the silky contour of her underskirt. And he would reproach himself for not loving her more. He longed to see her again. He would return home quickly, climb the stairs, his heart pounding. Emma in her room was dressing. He came in on silent feet. He kissed her on the back. She cried out. He could not refrain from constantly touching her comb, her rings, her scarf. Sometimes he gave her great full-lipped kisses on her cheeks, or a string of little kisses up her bare arm from the tips of her fingers to her shoulder. And she would push him away with a weary half-smile as one does a clinging child. Before her marriage, she had believed that what she was experiencing was love. But since the happiness that should have resulted from that love had not come, she thought she must have been mistaken. And Emma tried to find out just what was meant in life by the words bliss, passion, and intoxication, which had seemed so beautiful to her in books. And the last, the last passage I'll read is, is when she's well into her disillusionment, when they're still living at Tost before they move. Um, points of view and also transitions. There's a terrific transition from a mention of the callousness of father's hands, of country people's father's hands, to Pierre Rouault arriving for a visit. And Flaubert was very uh, worried about transitions. He talked a lot of, in his letters about working at getting good transitions. 
and then um, the gradual shift into Emma's mind during the father's visit. But it was above all at meal times that she could not bear it any longer in that little room on the ground floor with the stove that smoked, the door that creaked, the walls that seeped, the damp flagstones. All the bitterness of life seemed to be served up on her plate. And with the steam from the boiled beef, there rose from the depths of her soul other gusts of revulsion. Charles took a long time eating. She would nibble a few walnuts or, leaning on her elbow, pass the time drawing lines on the oilcloth with the tip of her knife. Now she let everything in the house go, and the elder Madame Bovary, when she came to spend part of Lent at Tost, was very surprised at the change. Indeed, she, once so neat and refined, would now go whole days without dressing, wear stockings of gray cotton, and use a candle for light. She would repeat that they had to economize since they were not rich, adding that she was very content, very happy, that she liked Tost very much, and other novel remarks that closed the mother-in-law's mouth. Moreover, Emma no longer seemed inclined to follow her advice. Once, even when Madame Bovary took it upon herself to maintain that employers ought to oversee their servants' religious life, she had answered her with an eye so angry and a smile so cold that the good woman did not meddle again. Emma was becoming difficult, capricious. She would order dishes for herself and not touch them, one day drink only pure milk, and the next cups of tea by the dozen. Often she stubbornly refused to go out, then she felt stifled, opened the windows, put on a thin dress. After she had browbeaten her maid, she would present her with gifts or send her for a stroll to visit the neighbors, just as she sometimes threw all the silver coins in her purse to the poor, though she was scarcely tender-hearted or easily touched by another's emotion, like most people born of country folk, whose souls always retain something of the callousness of their father's hands. Toward the end of February, Père Buo, in memory of his recovery, came in person with a superb turkey for his son-in-law, and he stayed at Tost for three days. Since Charles was seeing patients, Emma kept him company. He smoked in the bedroom, spat on the andirons, chatted about crops, calves, cows, chickens, and the town council, so that she closed the door behind him when he left, with a feeling of relief that surprised even her. The fact was she no longer hid her scorn for anything or anyone, and she would sometimes express singular opinions condemning what was generally approved and commending perverse or immoral things, which made her husband stare at her wide-eyed. Would this misery last forever? Would she never find a way out of it? And yet she was certainly just as good as all those women who lived happy lives. She had seen duchesses at La Vaubiesa with heavier figures and more vulgar manners, and she cursed God's injustice. She would lean her head against the walls and cry. She would think with envy of tumultuous night, of tumultuous lives, nights at masked balls, outrageous pleasures, and all the wild emotions unknown to her that they must inspire. From there, it's all down. <laughs>